How's everyone doing? Let me know when, when y'all get in here and uh, put something in chat. And, and thank you all for, for putting your name in there. That makes it easier for me when I go and record attendance after class. So. Alright, I hope everyone's still doing well. I'm getting through the week okay. Um, we're going to continue where we left off on Monday. And uh, because I don't have to go through and introduce the course, we should make a lot more progress today, I, I think we would expect. Um, so we'll wrap up section one pretty quickly, and then we'll move on into section two and maybe have time for section three as well. Um, I think we will. But we'll we'll see where we go. We don't. There's no. By no means do we have to rush through everything. But uh, we like to try to get through chapter one relatively quickly. It's really like I said before, just terminology and uh, basic concepts. That way we can get on to the, some of the more uh, significant things that we need to talk about. So, do you, does anyone have any questions before we begin? I don't think I assigned any. Uh, any homework just yet. So to continue where we left off, we we had just talked about variables. Which is essentially the 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 question that we're asking. When we're trying to collect data. Now, we had said that we could split this up into two types of variables. We have categorical uh, variables, which um, describe the individual using non-numeric um, um, uh, 
responses, I guess we could say. Now, there were a few exceptions to that, so I'll, I'll put an asterisk after a numeric, non-numeric, because we did talk about a few um, numbers that are considered categorical variables, and that would be like our zip code, or student ID, or social security, or phone numbers, um, things like that, where we, we would never collect these and add these numbers together. and come up with anything meaningful. Now we contrast that with quantitative variables. Which are uh, variables to describe an individual using numbers that either measure or count um, whatever it is that we're looking at. So we describe an individual using numeric values that measure or, or count uh, values. So, when we say that they measure or, or count, um, measurement means, uh, when we say measure, that typically means uh, time, uh, volume, uh, what else, um, area temperature, things like that are all measured. Whereas count, we just count uh, results, one, two, three, four, etc. Yeah, weight would definitely be measurement. Mm -hmm. So we would uh, count the number of siblings that we have, which technically zero is an option there, but zero, one, two, three, four, etc. But we would never measure the number of siblings we have, okay? We measure the amount of time it takes to complete a task or the volume of water in our, uh, uh, whatever uh, bottle we're drinking out of right now or a cup or something, or the, the the size of the area that uh, I'm working with on my desk here versus each of you, uh, or, the, or the temperature in the rooms that we're, each of us are in. So all of those things are measured. Mm -hmm. And so the first set of questions we want to look at in the, in the uh, textbook for this, and regrettably, Oops, let me, uh, yep. Try to ignore the blueprint. <laughs> um, let's look, uh, so uh, number of siblings, we already said that's a, a quantitative value. Um, what about the, the number on a football player's jersey? Is that something that we measure or count, or is it something that just describes that player? So 
So would that be quantitative or would it be categorical? It describes, yes. So when you see a, a player has the number 10 on their jersey, okay, that describes a very particular player. So it would be categorical, exactly. Yeah, so even though it's a numerical value, um, again, a, a, a player in sports, we wouldn't add their jersey numbers together and have that be anything meaningful. It really is just to tell people watching the game, hey, this player is over here if you want to pay attention to this person, uh, and so on. All right, um, number 20, the assessed value of a house. So basically how much a house is valued at for tax purposes. So when we talk about the uh, yeah, whenever you talk about money, this will be a quantitative value because money can be measured or counted as well. Um, I think generally we consider it uh, hmm, I forget how we, anyway, we'll get to that in a second. Um, and then student ID number, we already talked about that, that's going to be a categorical because it describes the student and identifies the student. Okay. Now, I'll give you some of those to work on in, in homework. as Because uh, I just looked at some of the even ones there. And we'll still do the odd ones. Now, quantitative variables are actually split up into two subcategories. So quantitative variables may be what we call discrete or continuous. So if we have discrete These are values that are counted. And if we have continuous, then the values are measured. Okay, and, and basically it takes these same concepts that we talked about up here, whether it's measured or counted, and splits it up further into two different other categories. Um, So when we say discrete, we're basically looking at whole number values, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Whereas continuous numbers, they can hit all the, the fractions and decimals in between. Now, as far as like, like how old a person is, for instance, um, we don't instantly go from being one age to the next. When I have my uh, birthday later this year, I won't all of a sudden go from being 44 to 45. It's actually an ongoing and, and gradual process. And so it's not like I instantly turned 45 because I was actually aging the entire time as the year passed. Um, and so your, your age is considered a continuous variable because we technically at this moment, we could break it down into years and days and hours and sec minutes and seconds and so on as far as and that's gradually changing and so that is considered a continuous measure so, um, and then that's an important distinction because uh, even though our age is continuous we actually use countable numbers for the most part just kind of rounding down each time we talk about how old we are Now, uh, based on this, we do have some more questions out of the textbook I want to look at. 
starting down here. Yeah, let's see, this is problem 24. The volume of water lost each day through a leaky faucet. So if we're talking about the volume of water, is that something that's measured or counted? Measured. You get measured, therefore continuous, right? So we would call that a continuous quantitative variable. Mm -hmm. Right. That's counterintuitive how I have to move that. Uh, the number of sequoia trees, number 26, the number of sequoia trees in a randomly selected acre of Yosemite National Park. So when we talk about the, the number of trees there, would that be a countable number or a measured number? Counted, good. Which, which then makes it discrete, right. Mm -hmm. Because when we count trees, even if the tree is uh, if it's been struck by lightning, split in half, branches have fallen off, we still call it one tree. It's not like we're calling it a fraction of a tree or anything like that. So whenever we, we count the trees, we count every type of tree, every stage of life it's in. It doesn't matter, it's still one tree. And so we never use any fractions or decimals to account for it. It depends on how the question is asked, Anna, um, or, or Davy Anna. Um, because in this case the question said the number of sequoia trees so it just says the number of trees then we're just going to count the number of trees but potentially it could say um, the size of the uh, of, of air you know the, the size that the the forest takes up over a period of 30 years and how that changes then we may say, okay, that's going to be a measured value because now we are talking about uh, uh, what is the area, what is the acreage that these uh, trees take up. And when we look at it from that point of view, it would be considered a measured variable. So it depends on whether we're counting the trees or we're actually measuring the area. But it, the way that the question is, is, is posed to us here is it's specifically asking us to find the number of trees. And so, yeah. So internet uh, 28, uh, internet connection speed in kilobytes per second. That would be continuous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, measured, which makes it continuous, right? Yeah, because when we talk about um, the speed of our internet, you know, we, we could have, what is it, I don't know, I don't know what I have, I think I have 200 megabit service, which is kind of overkill, but it's, it's nice, um, which 200 megabits, we'd have to divide that by, Eight to get megabytes, and then divide by one thousand twenty-four to get down the kilobytes. Yeah. Anyway, let's not worry about that. Um, but yeah, that, that would be considered a uh, a measured value because you know we 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 can get fractions and decimals still. Mm -hmm.
And finally, 30, the air pressure in pounds per square inch in an automobile tire. That is also going to be continuous or measured. Uh, yeah, both of those are appropriate here. Now, generally how we're going to ask these is it um, the way the questions are end up going to be on the test. Th these problems, like the, the earlier ones we looked at, as well as these in this section, uh, so like the, the 15 through 22 that we looked at, and then also the 23 through 30, what I'll do is I'll combine those together. So I'll give you a statement, and I'll ask you, is it uh, categorical or quantitative? And then if it is quantitative, we'll then say, is it continuous or is it discrete? So there, there's a couple of layers there, basically. So We'll look at that a little bit closer when it comes time to prepare for the exam, but I think it's good to go ahead and mention that now. So. Uh, if we said um, hmm. trying to think of a good example that isn't on the test because that's the only thing I can think of right now um, we think of um, the number of shoes, the or pairs of shoes that a person owns. First of all, is that categorical or is it quantitative? Quantitative? And, and it's kind of a giveaway in, in the statement uh, when we say the number of shoes number basically is telling us right away hey this is going to be quantitative um, but there are some certain numbers that, that we know that we can that are not quantitative but we can certainly find the average number of pairs of shoes that each person in class owns that's how I like to think about it. it. Is something quantitative? Quantitative is if we can take the average of something and have it be meaningful. So we could find the, the average number of pairs of shoes that a student at Milling College owns, and, and that would be a, a, a quantitative variable. Would it be continuous or discrete? discrete right because discrete we said we're counting the number of pairs of shoes that we have we don't worry about fractions or decimals in between we just want you know do we have one two three four etc pairs of shoes um, so yeah it would be quantitative and it would be discrete specifically I guess technically we could have half of a pair of shoes if we lost one shoe uh, but I wouldn't really call that a functional pair of shoes. Anyway, that's, that's getting into minutia. So. All right. So that takes care of section one. Section 1.2, this is on observational studies and designed experiments.
Okay. Oh, sorry. There you go. So, these are the, the two different ways that we classify statistical research. Statistical research could be an observational study, or it could be a designed experiment. So let's look at the characteristics of an observational study. Now, in an observational study, the point of this would be uh, for the researcher, a researcher would merely observe and collect information, but would not interfere with the subjects of the study at all. So, researchers observe and collect data. without interfering with the uh, subjects being studied. So this would be like uh, sitting at an intersection and, and counting the number of red cars that pass through the intersection over a period of an hour. Uh, we're not trying to inter interact. We're not trying to influence people to drive red cars. We're just seeing how many people drive cars that are red in color. Um, we could say, um, not necessarily observing, but collecting any, any time we send out a survey or complete a survey, that's an observational study. Uh, the person administering the survey does not try to influence the outcome at all. They just want to get the information so they could use it for uh, whatever it is that they're researching. Okay, They're not trying to influence the information at all, they just want to collect the information. And it's an important distinction. So we contrast that with an experiment, a uh, designed experiment. In a designed experiment, um, researchers uh, may not necessarily, but may split up subjects into two or more groups. Where treatments are applied, and the outcomes recorded. Okay. So the idea here is that the researcher, researcher does try to influence the outcome to an extent in that uh, we apply a treatment and then we see how does that affect the outcome. Does it affect the outcome positively? Does it affect it negatively? Um, and what do positive and negative even mean in context of that particular experiment? Kind of the, the, the classic example we like to use is if uh, a company is testing a new medication, for instance, a new, let's say a new pain reliever. Um, what they'll do is they'll have uh, usually have at least two groups. We may even choose to use three groups there. Like, let me let me write this out so we can kind of think about it.
sorry about scratch, scratching out letters. I'm misspelling things. and Again, I'm not using a pencil. So, so in our pain reliever experiment, we have three groups. Group one, we'll say it receives the placebo. Now, a placebo is basically an inactive um, ingredient. Basically, um, they aren't actually receiving the medication, um, but we want to make them think they're receiving the medication to see how, um, what kind of influence that has on them. Uh, the problem is that there's such a thing as the placebo effect, where if we think we're receiving medication, and maybe it's just like sugar or something in a pill. Um, we think we're receiving the medication and we actually feel better as a result. That's called the placebo effect, even though we haven't received any medication. Um, and so we, you know, and we, that kind of uh, frustrates researchers, but it's something that we have to be aware of. We want to make sure our medicine is actually working and not just uh, arbitrarily making someone feel better because of the placebo effect. Our second group, let's say we give them five milligrams uh, of the dosage and a third group will give them 10 milligrams. What writers we're talking about? I don't even know what kind of pain reliever we're talking about here. but. What we, what we may be doing is, first of all, testing what happens when they don't receive any of the medication. So technically this is the zero milligram group. Um, and then the second group receives five milligrams and the third group receives 10. And we can kind of see how different dosages affects these two groups. You know, does is five milligrams sufficient or does that not work as well as 10 milligrams, for instance? And are there any harmful side effects? Hopefully non-fatal, but um, you know, does it cause any other discomfort or um, dizziness or things like that that we would certainly need to be concerned with if we were a pharmaceutical company trying to develop something that we wanted to eventually get approved by the, the Food and Drug Administration. So we would have at least two, but sometimes more group if we want more groups if we want to test different dosages. Now the placebo group is also sometimes called the control group. And the control group basically exists so we can tell, okay, what happens if they don't receive any medication versus what happens if they receive this milligram five milligrams or if they receive ten milligrams. So the control group is necessary because if, um, you know, sometimes if people have a, a headache and like we have all these groups of people that have headaches and they come in and uh, they take the medication and maybe they just feel better naturally and that's what the con control group is for. A certain portion will already feel better on their own without even being given medication. That's just the, the body running its course and, and figuring things out on itself. Um, but sometimes it helps to have the medication to resolve it more quickly, and we want to see what those different levels do. So. Anyway, so uh, we break them into, you know, in this case we've got three groups. And so each of these receive a treatment. Technically the placebo is a treatment, although really it's kind of a non-treatment. But then we have a five milligram treatment and a 10 milligram treatment. So this is kind of our classic example of a designed experiment. Um, a lot of the times these are given as what we call double blind tests or double blind experiments. And what that means is that the people that are receiving the treatment don't actually know what group they're in. So you don't know if you're receiving the placebo if you're in this experiment, and you don't know if you're receiving five milligrams or 10 milligrams. All the medications are giving you are identical in size, but um, so, so we don't want that influencing 
you know, it, whether you, you know you got the treatment or not, we don't, we don't want that influencing whether you feel better or not. So we're trying to isolate particular outcomes based on which treatment was given, not whether you, if you knew you've received the treatment and feel better automatically. Okay. Again, it's the placebo effect that we're trying to manipulate here. Um, we call it double blind, not just because the person receiving the medication doesn't know what they're receiving. Uh, the actual researcher that gives the medication doesn't know what it is either. There has to be someone who knows what it is because we have to be able to keep track of it. But the one that actually administers it doesn't know which one it is. It's got some kind of label on it and then uh, maybe another researcher is keeping track of which label corresponds to which group. That way the person that hands them the medicine doesn't know what it is, the person that takes it doesn't know what it is, we just, we just know it's one of these three things. Um, and then we're control, we're trying to manipulate the variables in a way so that the, we're eliminating things that we don't need to worry about so we can focus on whether or not the, the medication actually works. So that's, again, that's kind of our classic example of an experiment. Now, the experiment doesn't need to be that complicated. Um, it can be a little bit more simple than that. Um, uh, a researcher could walk up to a person and hand them a $5 bill and ask them how their day is going. Okay, I mean, a control group might be people that don't receive a $5 bill. How is their day going? And you might get two very different answers based on that. So that, that I mean, that would be an experiment. I'm always open to experiments uh, where people give us money, but not always happening. So, um, so it could be a lot of different things. Uh, another experiment, we used to see this a lot when I was younger. You don't really see them anymore because... Uh, it, it, it used to be a, a thing where like people would take uh, cola taste tests, like do you prefer Coke or Pepsi? And it'd be like a table in the mall or something and then you have two cups and, and they're not labeled and one cup has Coke and one cup has Pepsi. And, and you taste both of them and you tell them which one you prefer and they say, oh, okay, you chose Coke or whatever. So turns out it's not a great idea to, to drink from a cup that you don't know what's in it. So we don't really do that kind of thing anymore. Um, so, yeah, and, and, but that, that is an example of an experiment because you're, they're, they're trying to discern what you like, not based on whether like you historically have favored Coke or Pepsi, but which one you judge based on taste, which is what they're trying to identify. Anyway. So going back to our observational study and our designed experiment, we have a set of questions that are basically they want us to read the question and determine which one it actually is. And so we'll look at some of these even problems. Okay. So number 10, rats with cancer are divided into two groups one group receives five milligrams of a medication that is uh, thought to fight cancer, and the other group receives 10 milligrams. After two years, the spread of the cancer is measured. Is that experiment or observational study? I'm trying to cover up the answer just to make it a little more interesting, but I think you'll recognize this one pretty quickly. Yeah, designed experiment, and, and, and again, it's the same situation we just talked about where they're given two different medications, and we just want to see which one is more effective.
Okay, so 12, a study in which balding men were compared with non-balding men at one point in time, found that balding men were 70% more likely to have heart disease. Observational. Mm -hmm. Right. And the reason we say observational here is that um, all we're doing is we're, we're asking them to answer a question. We're not trying to influence the outcome at all. And that's really the key difference between the two. Experiments try to influence the outcome by applying a treatment, whereas uh, observational studies here we're only trying to record what happened. We're not trying to influence in any way. Okay, and then number 16. Conservation agents netted 250 largemouth bass and determined how many were carrying parasites. Mm -hmm. Observational, definitely. Yeah, all we're, all we're doing is determining if they have parasites or not. We're trying not trying to influence whether they have parasites, not yet anyway. We just want to see if it's a problem before we try to do anything about it. Okay. Any questions on those? So as you suspect, I'll go ahead and answer or give you the odd problems there as homework. Okay. We're actually doing pretty good on time. That takes care of section two, so we should be able to get through section three today also. Which is great. So next we'll move on to section 1.3, which is on simple random sampling. Which Start with it. Um, so with simple random sampling, now we're. This is something that we started talking about back in chapter or section one, which was uh, when we talk about uh, sample versus a population. I mentioned that. You know, there's different ways for us to create a sample from a population. So the first method that we'll look at today in section one point three is on simple random sampling. And so a random sample the way that we would generate a random sample is we would assign a number to each individual in the population
and we then choose numbers at random and um, the numbers chosen are or become our sample so so individuals are then selected at random using what we call a random number generator that's that is typically what we use in these cases okay Um, so when you talk about a random number generator, this is basically, there's a lot of different ways this can be utilized, but it's any device or system that generates a number at random, basically. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, an easy example is a calculator. A lot of scientific calculators tend to have a random number generator. Uh, there's also websites online that act as what random number generators. Um, historically, um, you know, and this is kind of weird, but textbooks would have pages of random numbers, and what you would do is you'd have a, a ran all kinds of different numbers on a page. You cover your eyes and move your your pen around, and and finally point at a number, and that would be your random number. Thankfully, we've advanced a lot since then, and we have more sophisticated random number generators. But um, you can, if you look at older textbooks, like for uh, specific, specifically statistics textbook, I don't know if ours has that or not. It may, may actually, but they'll have pages of uh, just all the different, all kinds of different numbers on it, and this called a random number generator. And, and technically, it still works, but I don't know how effective it is overall. So let's look at a kind of a basic random number generator and a calculator. One thing that may be a little bit challenging is actually locating where this random number generator is on your particular calculator. Now on this one, for instance, we see right here it says random it's above this button, so that means we're going to, have to press second and random. Now, this particular one has a couple of different functions. I'm just going to use the basic one. And it gives us a number. This particular calculator, most calculators actually, will give us a number between 0 and 1. And it may not be immediately clear why that is helpful. And so, here, here's the deal. Let's say we have a list of 10 people. Okay. And we want to pick three at random. So each of these numbers has been assigned to a different person, probably alphabetically or you know in some kind of logical ordering. And so we got we press random in our calculator, we got this number. Well, what we do is we multiply it by the number of individuals that are in our group. So we'll multiply it by ten individuals, and it gives us a number, and then we'll just round to the nearest whole number at this stage. So 8.45, we'll round that to an 8. So whoever number 8 represents, we've selected them. We still need to pick two more. A second, random, and enter. So we get our answer here. Multiply it times 10. 
and we get 4.27, so we'll pick the, the fourth person in our list, whoever that happens to be. And we'll uh, repeat that again. Nope. I'll uh, we'll press second random. Now, the random in function, if your calculator has that, um, do I have a comma button here? No. I, apparently, I don't know how to use that. Oh, there, we do have a comma. Sorry. So, yes, absolutely. So we have a second and then random. Now, random int, if we choose to use that, I'm going to put one comma ten. And it'll give me a random number from one to ten. In this case, it gave me eight, which we already have number eight selected, so we don't want to pick them again. So we'll 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 try one more time. <laughs> Picked again, it gave us four. So one more time, and it gave us the ninth person. That's kind of the the nice thing about this random int function is it gives us a little bit more specificity. We don't have to do the whole rounding thing. We're multiplying by ten. It just gives us our answer, which is nice. So, if we do it the other way, again, a second random, just choose our random option, get our number by pressing enter, and then multiplying by 10, which is 3.59, so it rounds up to 4. So we would have picked number 4 again. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions on that? I guess I should ask. Okay. Now, looking at the uh, the TI eighty three. First read it. Oh, on. I think we go to math. Yes, we arrow over to PRB. And then the first option there is random. And we can press enter and then multiply by 10. So that would give us a random number of 3 in that case. Oh. The comma on this calculator is right above the decimal button. So we have to press second and then. So once again, on the 83s, we press math, we arrow over to probability, and random is the first option there. Now we could go down to random int, random integer in this case, and we want a number from 1 to 10. The, uh, the comma here is much more easy to get to. And it gives us our result that way, so it just gives us a 2. Okay. Even if you just have your phone, you know, we get on our phone and and turn it sideways to get the scientific calculator, at least on the iPhone. I don't, I'm not sure about Android. And uh, there should be a random function here somewhere because I know I've demonstrated this before. Oh, right here, yeah. So you just press random and it keeps giving you random numbers that way. Okay, now, if you don't want to mess around with any of that, then uh, we could go online. And there's a website called random.org.
And so we want a number between 1 and 10. And then we can have just generate a result. And the first one it gave us is 1. We press generate again, 4, and so on. And we keep repeating until we get however many we need. So there's there's functions on or, or, or sites online that have these functionality that we can utilize. You know, so there's a lot of different ways to use a random number generator. Okay. So, and um, so you have some different options that you want to use. Uh, the, kind of the strangest random number generator I ever read about, I never actually saw it, but it sounded really interesting, is uh, some scientists had taken, I forget how many that they use, but um, they took some lava lamps, if you know what those are, I'm maybe not, some of you don't know what that is. They took some lava lamps, which is like these lamps where this this wax um, balls or whatever just they as they heat up they float up and then as they cool they float down and so there's a, a lot of different pieces of wax in constant flux here. Anyway, they they lined up like six of these in a row and they shined a laser through the lamps. Now as the the wax would move through the where the the laser beam it would block some of the, some of the light from passing through and so what the scientists would do would they would measure the amount of the light from the laser that made it through all six lamps and um, that that would be the random number the percentage of the light that made it through um, it's interesting it's not useful but sometimes you find stuff like that um, interesting or, or just something fun to do I guess so there's a lot of different ways to do a random number generator um, now yeah so whichever one like you'll have a problem or two on your homework where it wants you to find some random numbers and and then uh, make a list from that so um, you know, whichever one you want to use, I would I would advise using the calculator, but you can use the website that I showed you, random.org. That's fine, and uh, you know any, any anything else you have available, like your phone has a random number generator that works as well. So, okay. So that's how we create a simple random sample. Um, and so we look here at problem 12. The following table lists the 44 presidents of the United States and they're in order and they've each been assigned a number according to when they're president. One of the oddities here is uh, we actually have the same person mentioned twice but that's because uh, Grover Cleveland served two terms but they were not in consecutive terms so he was both the 22nd president and the 24th president while in between um, Harrison was president. So. Anyway, so technically 44 presidents and 45 now. Um, so we want to obtain a simple random sample of size 8. Uh, that's, you can't quite see that. Simple random sample of size 8 uh, using whichever random number generator we prefer to use for that. And then we do it again using uh, the same approach basically just find two different random samples of size 8. Okay. And so that's what we would do. We get generate a random number and multiply it by 44 or we could say uh, let's see math over to PR, probability PRB 
if we want to use the random int function, random integer, we would say 1, 44. No, no, we want to make sure the, the second number is the, the last number on the list. The 8 means that we would do this 8 times. Now the nice part about this function, random int 1, 44, is we can just keep pressing enter and it'll execute the command again and, and just give us different numbers. Okay. Any questions so far? Probably that your biggest concerns are going to be about the calculator. Hopefully everyone's able to use their calculator to figure this out. And so that's that's one with the presidents, but the one I'm going to give you is number 11. And, and we want to find a sample of 10 states by selecting them at random. Okay. The good thing here is there's really no correct answer because um, each of you is probably going to get a different set of 10 states or 8 presidents for these different lists if we went through with that. Okay. I think that's all I need to cover. If you get the same number twice, we don't want to list the same number twice, so if it, we get a number that repeats, then we just don't count that one and we get another number. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so if we choose nine twice and, and we come up with Florida two times, we don't want to write it down two times. We want ten different states. So we'll write Florida down once and we'll try to get nine others that are not Florida, basically. Which one was that, Deviana? With the presidents? Mm -hmm. It's the same process with the presidents as it is with the states. I'm, I'm not going to give you the president, president one for homework. I'll give you the, the state one. Um, but the idea is that, you know, however many we have, in this case we have 44 individuals um, that have been present at the time of the book's printing. We know it's 45 now. Um, we just want to pick eight different random numbers. And again, they have to be different. And uh, write down which presidents those correspond to, and that will be our random selection of presidents. And then part B says basically repeat that process and get another list of eight individuals. Now on the second list, it can have some of the same people that are on the first list, but each list has eight different individuals from that other people on that same list, basically. Does that answer your question? So on, okay, good. So on 11, it says obtain a sample of size 10 using you know whatever, uh, which whatever one you want to use. 
and then attain a second sample of size 10 again using whatever approach you like. Now Texas could appear on both lists if we happen to choose number 43 but we don't want Texas twice for part A. We could have Texas as an answer to part A and also part B if we end up picking 43 for both of those. It's not likely but it's certainly possible. All right, so let me write down homework problems. And what I'll do is I'll uh, take a, a picture of the homework from the book and, and put that in the files in Canvas um, so you all can access that. I know maybe not everyone has a book just yet. Um, let's see. So first of all, on uh, page 11, Look at 15 through 29 odd. Then on page 19, look at 9 through 15 odd. And then finally on page 26, look at number 5 and 11. Now on page 11, this first part, that's on whether the variable is quantitative or categorical, and if uh, other problems with it's quantitative, is it discrete or continuous? N page 19, these are on it, you know, we have a paragraph describing uh, statistical research and we want to decide if it's an uh, observational study or a designed experiment. And 26 is on just random numbers. So when I say odd, I mean just the odd numbers there. So like it'd be 15, 17, 19, 9, 11, 13, 15, and then 5 and 11. Okay. Now, it seems like a lot of problems, but I think they'll go pretty quickly, as you can imagine. Most of them are just like simple one word responses. Uh, so I hope that all goes well. Uh, again, it's not to be turned in for a grade, this is just for you all to practice and make sure you understand what we've been doing. But I definitely recommend that you work through these problems before the next class. Um, do uh, so, yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'll make sure I take pictures of these and, and put them on Canvas. Well, as soon as we end. Um, but I hope everyone has a good weekend, uh, good rest of the week, and take care of yourselves. And I will. Talk to you again on Monday. See you all later. Yes, uh, as soon as we finish, I'll go ahead and get those, those done.